Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study and prayer time. And tonight we're beginning a new uh, study. It's a four-part uh, series on parenting. And um, I hope that uh, you will uh, maybe share uh, this with some other people that you know, maybe some young parents and uh, people in our church or people in your family, uh, maybe people that you know at work, um, and uh, maybe they can tune in on our next video and catch up with uh, what we're uh, saying in this series. I'm excited about sharing these messages uh, with you, and I'm praying that God will use them to help you uh, to become a better parent and to understand that you are not alone in this uh, very important responsibility that God has given to us as husbands and wives, uh, moms and dads. Before we get into our study, uh, let me begin with a word of prayer. Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you this evening that we can once again delve into your word. Lord, I pray that you will just speak to us through your Holy Spirit as you uh, take the message of your word and implant it on our minds and in our hearts. And God, I do pray for all of the young couples in our church and outside of our church, those that are truly seeking your will and trying to be the best parents they can be to their children. Or do we live in difficult days and uh, parenting is becoming, it seems like, harder and harder. And I just uh, pray that you will use me, use your word, uh, to be an encouragement uh, to anyone out there who may be struggling in this uh, area of their life. Lord, we pray that you will just be honored and glorified through our study and that everyone who is listening, who is tuned in to our uh, study by way of video uh, will be blessed. We love you and we praise you, God, and we just thank you so much for all the many ways that you continue to show your love to us. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. John Rosemont is a family psychologist, and he wrote in the Naples Daily News a couple of years ago an interesting article. And in that article, he, he wrote uh, these words. Listen to what he said. He said, I recently asked a couple who have three kids who are the most important people in your family like all good moms and dads they answered our kids why i asked what is it about your kids that gives them that status they couldn't answer so i answered for them there is no reasonable thing that gives your children that status I went on to point out that many, if not most, of the problems they're having with their kids are the result of treating their children as if they and their family exist because of the kids when it is, in fact, the other way around. Their kids ex exist because of them and thrive because they have created a stable family. Without them, the parents, instead of lives that are relatively carefree, their children would be living lives full of worry and want. He goes on to say, the most important person in an army is the general. The most important person in a corporation is the CEO. The most important person in a classroom is the teacher. And the most important people in a family are the parents. Then Dr. Roseman said this, the primary objective should not be raising a straight-A student who excels at three sports, earns a spot on the Olympic swim team, goes to an A-list university, and becomes a prominent brain surgeon. The primary objective is to raise a child such that a community and culture are strengthened. Our child is the most important person in our family is the first step toward raising a child who feels entitled. You don't want that, he says. Unbeknownst to your child, he doesn't need that, and neither does America. Friend, this evening I want to talk about 
parenting, the awesome responsibility of parenting, specifically how to raise spiritual champions. Our church wants to help strengthen your marriage. We want to improve, help you improve your parenting skills as you seek to raise your children to become spiritual champions for God. This evening and for the next three Wednesday nights, I'm going to be teaching on a series that I've called Counter Culture Parenting. We're going to talk about raising spiritual champions, knowing and trusting God, developing a biblical worldview for our children, positive parenting, and loving discipline, how to connect consequences with choices. Friend, I want to encourage you this evening. God wants us to raise spiritual champions. Boys and girls who grow up, mature into um, youth, and then into young adulthood, who can leave home one day, go out into the world, and be different from the surrounding culture as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, King David was a spiritual champion. In fact, Scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. Well, how did that happen? We find the secret to David's life of faith, his, the secret of his commitment to God in the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. When David was going out to meet the giant Philistine, King Saul said to Abner, the commander of his army, in 1 Samuel 17 verse 55, King Saul asked Abner, whose son is this youth? Abner said to the king, he didn't know. So Saul said, inquire whose son the boy is. Well, after David returned from defeating the giant, Saul asked David, he said, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Friend, Saul wanted to know about David's home. He wanted to know who David's parents were. Why? Because home is the most powerful influence in all of life, for good or bad. Because of that, the home is the most important place on earth Satan knows that truth, and that's why Satan will do everything he can to attack you, your kids, you, all of your family. Um, that's why he is always attacking uh, Christian homes and Christian marriages. He knows if a home is godly, it will produce spiritual champions. So he attacks it. God wants Christian parents to be different, to be distinct from other parents. He wants you to take a stand. Sadly, though, many Christian homes have lost their uniqueness, their distinctiveness. That Many Christian homes look no different than the homes of non-believers. Um, they have blended into the culture. God tells us in His Word that we are to be salt and we are to be light. But when we blend into the culture, we lose our Christian identity. A Christian home where spiritual champions are raised is intentionally different. They, they, they are different on purpose. They set out to be different than the culture around them. That's why um, uh, parenting needs to be, if it's going to be parenting that pleases God and has the uh, most positive effect on your children, it needs to be counter culture. So here's what I want you to take from this study this evening, and that's this. In order to raise spiritual champions, well, our homes must be decidedly different from the world. From the moment our child 
is born, from the moment your children are born, we realize that we have been given an enormous responsibility. I'll never forget when my uh, first child, my son was born and I held him for the first time well, when what should have been a great amount of joy and it was. I, was, I was so happy to be a father for the first time and yet as I was holding him and experiencing the emotion of joy all of a sudden I felt the weight, the burden of responsibility, a huge burden of responsibility that I was responsible for this young baby's well-being. Friend, we want to know how to parent. And when you become a parent, you don't know how to parent, but we want to know. We want to be the best parents we can be for our kids. What does God expect of us? We can't just turn that child over and expect to find the instructions or tape to their back. We wish there were, that they came with instructions that tell us exactly what we need to do in order for them to turn out right, in order for them to grow up, to become godly men and women. So where do we go? If, the, if, if uh, when a child is born, um, we don't have the instruction manual uh, right there with us. Where do we go? What, what do we use to guide us as we seek to be good parents? Well, we, know, we, we have to go to the only truly reliable instruction ma manual parenting there is, and that's the Bible, the Word of God. In His Word, God gives specific instructions to parents on how to raise spiritual champions. And I'm sure that that's what you want for your son or your daughter, that you want them to be spiritual champions for God. So what I want to do this evening is to give you some advice from God's Word on how you can do just that. Um, uh, the clearest statement on parenting is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. There we read where Solomon says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, let's look. There are two aspects of counterculture parenting found in this one verse. First of all, let's note that, uh, look at the responsibility for counterculture parenting. Our responsibility as parents is, look again there in the verse, train up a child in the way he should go. That word train that Solomon uses here originally referred to the palate the roof of the mouth, the gums. And in its verbal form, it referred to the action of a midwife who, after helping to deliver a child, would dip her fingers into the juice of crushed dates, and then she would take her finger and reach into the mouth of that newborn baby, and she would take her finger and just kind of move it around to the top of his mouth, creating a taste in that child's mouth. He would begin to suck on that finger because of the taste of that juice. Then the midwife would take that baby after creating that desire for the taste of that juice. And as it began to suck on that midwife's finger, she would then take that baby over to the mother and place that baby in the mother's arms. And that baby would then begin to suck on her mother and uh, get milk from her, uh, the boy or the girl's mother. Friend, that's what I want you to see here tonight. That th that baby is doing the same thing that God wants us to do when we begin to look at what it is that we need to be as parents. 
In a similar way, a parent is to create a thirst for the nourishing flow of God's wisdom that is found in His Word. This is the goal of our training. Just like the midwife takes the time to create that desire for the mother's milk, you and I as parents are to create the desire for God um, in our training with our children. I want you to see two points related to the training of children. First, note the type of training. Now, to do this, I want you to take your Bible, hold it here in Proverbs 22, turn back over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in verses 4 through 9, I want you to look at what Moses says to the people of Israel as they stood on the edge of the promised land. Let's read it together. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your, go on your gates. While they were about to be richly blessed as they were entering the promised land, the Israelites needed to know that there were some things in this new land that weren't so promising. Dwelling in the land were the godless and immoral Canaanites. And God gave Israel a mandate to defeat and to drive out these pagan people. In no way were they to cohabit with them. They were not to adopt their gods or embrace their lifestyle. In order for that to happen, though, the parents must first be faithful and committed to God, and they must make the training of their children a priority. Parents, let me ask you, are you fully committed to the Lord in your own life? If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you fully devoted to Christ's Lordship in your life? Are you committed to His church? And are you committed to God's will for you and your children? How different is your home from the other homes in your neighborhood. If Sunday is the only difference between us and our lost neighbors, <clears throat> between our us and our lost co-workers, or our uh, children's classmates, then we're never going to impact the secular culture for the Lord. If we are merely putting on our Sunday face, and coming to church once a week for an hour or two, but there's not much difference in our lifestyle, in the way we think, in the way we act, in the way we feel, in the way we approach life. If there is not much difference in the way we approach life and the way our lost neighbors and friends approach life, then our home and our children are not going to be what we say we want. Parents have a God-given responsibility to show and tell God to their children. You see, what you say is not going to make much difference. It's how you live before your children that's going to have the great, greatest impact. You can tell them you love God, but you've got to show them and that's not easy. In other words, we must be fully devoted to the Lord in every aspect of our life, in our personal lives, in our work life, in our family life, uh, in our recreational life, in every aspect of our life. God must come first. Jesus must be Lord of all. We want to make sure that our home is Christian to the core. So how do we do that? Well, we must both know 
the Lord and we must love the Lord. If we love the Lord with all of our heart, His words will be on our heart. Look what Moses says there in the Deuteronomy passage in verse 6. He says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You see, it is out of the overflow of a vital, loving relationship with God that parents are to train their children. We have to teach our children to know God and to respond to God. And to do that, our training should first be persistent. Moses says, look in verse 7. He said, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now those words, teach them diligently in Hebrew, mean to sharpen. Teaching God's Word is meant to make your child sharp, to make them keen, to make them perceptive, to make them discerning. The parent's training serves to sharpen the child's character. And that training is to be continual. Look what it says. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. In other words, what Moses was telling the Israelites is, you're to teach your children the way of God, the things of God, in every aspect of life. When you get up in the morning, when you sit down for a meal, when you're walking down the road, when you're uh, uh, at work, when you're uh, playing together, when you're eating a, a dinner at night, before you go to bed, every part of your day, and in everything you're doing, something ought to be uh, said or communicated uh, pertaining to your walk and your relationship with the Lord. The biblical education of our children never stops. Friend, it is <laughs> training your child biblically is taking place when you sit at your dinner table, when you ride down the street in your neighborhood on your bikes or when you're walking through the neighborhood as a family, which I see happening in my neighborhood quite a bit, especially during this pandemic. I'll see parents with their young children, uh, one maybe walking, another maybe riding their bike. Those are opportunities that Moses is talking about. When you, when you continue to teach your children, you look out at the creation around it, it's an opportunity to tell your children about how God uh, created the world and everything in it. Moses is saying that take advantage of every opportunity you have to teach your children. Uh, when you're tucking your child into bed at night, read them a Bible story, pray with them. When uh, riding in the car, um, in the normal routine of daily life, as well as when they come to church and they're sitting in a Sunday school class, or when they're sitting in the worship service on Sunday, when they participate in Awana, or Vacation Bible School, or D-Now. All of these are training tools for your children to help them become spiritual champions for God. Let me just say, your child is not always going to like and not even enjoy always the training that you're um, uh, putting them through. <clears throat> I mean, think about it. What athlete or what soldier ever enjoys the rigorous training they must go through in order to be a great athlete or a skilled soldier? However, it is our responsibility as parents to make sure that they continue their training for the duration of the time that we have them under our care. And can I just say, it's so much easier in the home that is counterculture, in the home where God is talked about a lot and modeled in every area of life. That's the first thing. Our training needs to be persistent. Second, it needs to be purposeful. Look again there in the um, uh, text. 
The training you give your children should prepare them for the real world. Um, uh, in, in light of what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, so that they become children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. In order for the Israelites to prepare their children for the real world of Canaan, they needed to keep God's commands firmly in hand and in the forefront of their minds. Look what Moses writes in verses 8 and 9 in Deuteronomy. He says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now the Jews interpreted this in a literal sense and placed those same passages into small containers which they would then attach to doorpost. But the picture here that Moses is painting for us in this verse is really one of progression outside the home. Through this imagery here, God appears to be saying that the children are leaving home prepared for departure out into the world and that every step of the way these commandments are to be reminders to them. They are to hold on to them. As Solomon instructs in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. And then just a few verses later, he says in that same uh, third chapter of Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Friend, here's the purpose for counterculture parenting. This is like a three-part contract. God says... If we trust Him, if we don't lean on our own understanding, then and if we acknowledge Him in everything we do, then He will take care of our children's future. In other words, God says, train them my way and I will bless and honor them. Friend, all I can tell you is this, is this. I was blessed to grow up in a home where my parents um, trained us um, to love the Lord, to follow the Lord, to obey the Lord. Um, we went to church um, every Sunday. Um, uh, we, we were in Sunday school on Sunday morning, went to worship, went back to church on Sunday night, what they used to call training union, then to church again. On Wednesday, we were there for uh, the supper, uh, the fellowship meal that we would have each uh, Wednesday night, then followed that with RAs or GAs, depending upon um, whether you were a boy or a girl. Uh, we did that while my parents were in prayer meeting. Uh, we were in church, it seemed like, all the time. At home, um, we would have what we would call family altar um, every night after supper. Uh, we, there used to be the Home Life magazine that Southern Baptist put out. I believe it is still published. And in that magazine, there would be a devotion, scripture passages, and a time for prayer. And my father would assign uh, somebody to read the devotion, somebody to sign scripture, and then we would go around. There were seven kids in my family. And so my, us seven kids, my mom and dad, we would go around our living room and say uh, small prayers as a family. And I didn't always like that. I didn't always enjoy it. I wanted to be outside with my friends, especially in the summertime when it was still nice outside. I wanted to be out there playing ball. Um, but my dad insisted that we do that every night after um, uh, supper. When I was in college and I was off track and I had wandered away from the Lord, I can only tell you this. It was the memories of those kinds of things that God used to get me back on track. Moses says, teach your children these things 
not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but let it be a lifestyle where you are teaching, you are training them in the ways of God. Now turn back to Proverbs 22, verse 6. I want you to see another important truth. The time for training. Two words in this verse glick give us clear parameters of the child's training in terms of time. Look what it says. <clears throat> Solomon said, train up a child in the ways you go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The word child there generally refers to the period of childhood between infancy and ages four or five. But the Bible uses the term in a broader sense, ranging from a newborn all the way to a person of marriageable age who is still living under the parent's roof. So the responsibility of the parents is to begin creating a thirst for God in their children from the time of infancy. And that training is to continue as long as the child is under the parent's care. Parents, your responsibility in training your children starts the moment your child is born. And it doesn't stop until they leave home and set out on their own. Your training will result in your son or your daughter becoming a spiritual champion for God. The bottom line is the solemn duty of every parent to train their children in the ways of God. And if we do that, God um, will hold us responsible for it. Don't ever trust anybody else to do that. Thank God for Christian schools. Thank God for Christian teachers. Thank God for children and youth ministries in our churches. But I want you to understand, these are not to take the lead in training your children. They are simply to partner with you, to help you, but you are responsible for the primary training of your children. Which brings me to my second major point, the result of counterculture parenting. Solomon says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he says, he will not depart from it. Now the meaning here is that when we have fulfilled our parental responsibility to our children, they will be equipped to serve God when they move into adult life. They will become what God intended them to be, fully mature and godly men and women. Friend, the question really is this. Will we as parents dedicate ourselves to God's plan for raising and training our children Cornerstone Baptist Church believes strongly in this plan. We believe it is the only way to guarantee that our children become the spiritual champions God intends for them to be. Most parents would say their primary goal is for their children to be happy. But is that enough? I ask you, is it really enough? that your children just grow up and be happy. It can't be. It was never God's intent for that to be all that our children were meant to be. If you only aim for happy, you will end up in the ditch. However, if you aim for holiness and purity, I can assure you happiness will follow. We must raise our children with eternity in mind. How do we do that? By cultivating homes that are different from the surrounding culture. So I challenge you this evening, if you're not doing it already, to determine from this point to 
parent differently than the way you have been and from the way the world outside tells you you should and start doing it God's way and parent counter to the culture in which we live and by doing so you and I are assured that one day we can look back and we can see where the training that we gave to our children oh there may have been some bumps in the road our children aren't perfect just like we weren't and they might stray here and there and they might veer off track for a while but if we've done what God has instructed us to do I can assure you that you have a far better chance of raising spiritual champions than by not doing so and I know as it was with my wife and me that's what our goal was when we had our two children that they might one day grow up to be spiritual champions for God would you pray with me Father we thank you tonight for your word and Lord I thank you for uh, these words of uh, Solomon as well as the words of Moses and Lord Dad uh, help us to see how we can best train our children to be spiritual champions for you God I pray for every parent listening pray that you would give them wisdom knowledge uh, to know and discern your will for them for their children and the faith to trust you and uh, Lord I pray that there would be many boys and girls who grow up in this day who will become godly men and women for the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friend. Glad you tuned in. Look forward to sharing with you again next Wednesday and uh, hopefully might see you on Sunday in church. God bless.